Hi everyone, welcome to the RX 7900 XT buying guide. As usual, we will compare which models have better coolers, VRMs, and power limits. In terms of performance, any RX 7900 XT will perform similarly at default. It's only when you overclock that the more capable cards will see performance differences. But even if you don't plan to overclock, there is no downside to picking a better card as long as you don't pay significantly more. On the RX 7900 XT, basically all the cards use the same VRMs with a few exceptions. That means that all the cards are just as capable in terms of VRMs. The reference specification by AMD seems to be a 14 phase by 70 amp VRM, totaling 980 amps for the core and a 3 phase by 70 amp VRM, totaling 210 amps for the memory. You might notice that this is incredibly powerful compared to the Nvidia cards, and you'd be right. This VRM is used on the majority of the different cards and it is more than enough to power the Navi 31 GPU on the RX 7900 XT, even with an unlocked power limit. Now I could only find information that the power color Red Devil uses a slightly more powerful 15 phase VRM, but this doesn't really matter since the reference VRM is already so powerful and that is the VRM that most of the other cards are using. Now for the power limits on these AMD cards, there are some differences to how NVIDIA cards handle power limits that we need to discuss. On NVIDIA cards, the power limit is a hard cap for the power consumption of the whole card that is measured off the chip using a separate shunt resistor and a power monitoring chip to measure the power consumption coming into the card itself. On AMD cards, the power limiter is defined by a package power tracking limit that has both a short and long duration limit similar to how AMD handles power limits on their CPUs. The power consumption is then measured by the VRM controller itself. The result is that the VRM power losses, the fans, and the RGB LEDs on the cards are not monitored and controlled by this power limit, unlike on the Nvidia cards. This is why the PPT of the AMD cards are lower than their real-world power consumption. The maximum allowable increase in power limit from the default setting is also a flat 15% for all the cards, Hence why I only list the default power limiters in the short and long term PPT since you can deduce the max power limits by just adding 15% on top of both of those limits. What overclockers won't like from this method of power limiting is that it's not easily bypassed like on Nvidia cards, where you can just do a shunt mod to fool the card that it's using less power than it is. On AMD cards, you need to be able to access the I2C interface of the voltage controller and change its power monitoring scaler to report lower power to the GPU. Previously, you can use the More Power tool by Iger's Lab on the RX 6000 series to do this, while on the new RX 7000 series cards, AMD has cut off access to this interface via software. So the only method is to solder an Elmore EVC interface to the voltage controller directly. Not exactly a method that most people would do for a daily driver system. This means that a high power limit is important for AMD cards, since it's difficult to modify the power limit by yourself. But even then, the power limiters on the higher end cards are still not enough. This is especially true on the RX 7900 XT, where the power limiters are much more conservative than the on the RX 7900 XTX, with the most powerful card, the XFX Mark 310, only beating the reference RX 7900 XTX by a small amount. The ASRock Phantom is also interesting since it has the highest short PPT limit of all the cards while having a mid-tier long PPT limit. This might be to increase performance as much as possible while staying within the PCIe power specs for a dual 8-pin card. I also wanted to add that the power limits on the Power Color cards and the Sapphire Nitro is only a speculation by me. Based on how the RX 7900 XTX versions compared to the other card models, the Sapphire Nitro should be the highest power limiter card since it is the only RX 7900 XT with a triple 8 pin power input, while the other cards only have dual 8 pins. But I cannot be sure until someone with the card can check the PPT limits on hardware info. So if you do have the Sapphire Nitro RX 7900 XT, please do comment down below what the PPT limits are when you open hardware info. Now for the cooling performance of the different cards, you can't directly compare temperatures from different reviews since their test conditions are different. So I gathered the performance results measured by TechPowerUp since they always reviewed the most different models, and then other reviewers to then combine the results by correcting the temperatures to TechPowerUp's results. By calculating the average delta temperature and noise measured by the same cards that TechPowerUp tested and applying a correction to any card that isn't tested by TechPowerUp. 
which lets me combine the results from different reviews to a single graph with reasonable accuracy that it's good enough for comparisons. Unfortunately, for the RX 7900 XT, I couldn't find many reviews on the different models at all even after all this time. There's really only the Sapphire Pulse and the reference card that's been reviewed by a lot. So I figured it's better if we just go through the RX 7900 XTX temperature data again with only the cards that are available in the XT versions, since the custom models use the same coolers anyways. The only downside is not being able to directly compare to the reference RX 7900 XT cooler, but you can always just check out the Tech Power Up review and compare that to the Sapphire Pulse for example. On the RX 7900 XT, the reference cooler is also smaller at only a dual slot card compared to the triple slot RX 7900 XTX reference cooler, so it might be a good choice for a small ITX build. So with this graph of the RX 7900 XTX models, all the cards have coolers that are capable to keep the GPU temperature under 60 degrees and hotspot temps under 80 degrees. Unfortunately, they don't have memory temperature sensors. But since it uses the cooler GDDR6 memory, it shouldn't be an issue in the first place unlike GDDR6X. On the RX 7900 XT, it should run even cooler since the coolers are the same as the XTX versions but with a lower TDP GPU. On the XT versions, it is also the same where the quiet modes of the cards have lower power limits than the performance modes. Which by seeing the XTX versions of these cards in this graph, you can have a card with either higher noise levels from an increased fan speed like the XFX Merx and ASUS Tough, or higher temperatures since they keep the fan speeds low like the Sapphire Nitro. The power color Hellhound also performs pretty well, looking like being in the middle of the pack in terms of cooling performance. The XFX card on the other hand seems to just not have that great of a cooler despite the huge size. It's either much noisier to run cooler or almost as noisy as the reference card. For the other cards that don't have any reviews yet, here's a tier list that I came up with. As per usual, this isn't 100% accurate as it's all my estimation from seeing the cards that are reviewed and comparing them to how the coolers from these other non-reviewed cards are built, considering their size and their material as well as their design and the fans that they have. This should still be accurate enough that the cards in the same tier will perform pretty similarly in terms of cooling performance. So here we can see that basically all the cards are great for the RX 7900 XT and I don't see how they can be different from the XTX version since they basically just use the same coolers on the XT cards. It seems like the general quality is again much higher than the partner cards using Nvidia GPUs and this is probably due to AMD pricing their GPUs cheaper and therefore letting the partners get a bigger cut of the sale price of the GPUs, allowing them to design better quality cards and still make a profit. While on the Nvidia camp, all the partners have to skimp and cut corners everywhere in order to even make a profit on a sale, which is probably why EVGA backed out of making Nvidia GPUs. Lastly, here is the overall tier list of all the cards. This is not in any particular order within the tiers except for alphabetical order, as the cards are pretty closely matched in this generation. If any manufacturer disagrees with this tier list, please contact me and convince me why your card should be higher by sending me a review sample or explaining to me why so that I can see for myself. Otherwise, I am very confident in the tiers that I place the cards at, and the point of this tier list is to help buyers buy a higher tier card whenever possible in their budget, so that you're paying always for the best card possible. Buying a higher tier card if it's the same price as a lower tier card that you are looking at. In the end, since the cards are overall very high quality and well built, I would say that the tier list is really only by the power limits that they set in the VBIOS, which on the XT version is actually not that huge of a difference between the lowest and higher power cards anyways, but the Sapphire Nitro would be at the top considering it's the triple 8-pin power input card and therefore should theoretically has the highest power limiter, although that is not confirmed. The only confirmed card that has the highest power limiter is the XFX Merc, which has a 290 watt PPT long-term power limit. So if you're going for maximum performance, that card is a good choice as long as you don't mind the fan noise. On the other hand, I consider the ASUS Tough and Powercolor Red Devil S tier since they have S tier coolers and power limits that are just under the XFX Merc. The ASRock Phantom is not S tier this time since the power limiter is lower than the other S tier cooler cards. While the Gigabyte Gaming OC only has an A tier cooler, so it can't really be an S tier card. 
Then the MSI Gaming Trio, Power Color Hellhound, Sapphire Pulse, and XFX Merc are great A tier cards with coolers that are much better than the reference card and the same overbuilt VRM that's on all the cards. That's all for this buying guide. Leave a comment if you've taken apart your RX 7900 XT and found my VRM analysis wrong or found my power limits wrong or leave a like if I made you feel good about your RX 7900 XT purchase. As always, subscribe if you don't want to miss more buying guides like this and thanks for watching.